colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen on Zoom. Welcome to our National Security Law Conference, uh, Hong Kong under China's National Security Law. Uh, my name is uh, Hua Lin Fu, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Law. Uh, first of all, let me uh, apologize for canceling the uh, in-person session of the conference. Uh, we did plan uh, for a hybrid uh, mode, but unfortunately, the uh, black ring uh, yesterday uh, has made it impossible. Um, there was a significant uh, water leakage in our conference room. Um, so the conference now is entirely online. That is essentially a book conference. Um, some of you may recall that um, we had a, a number of uh, national security law uh, seminar uh, a, a few months back. Um, we asked some of the speakers to write up their, their presentation. Now the chapters are most, mostly ready and are with our Hong Kong U press. We thought it is a good idea to get all the authors together to really chat about the chapters. And since we are doing this online, we thought uh, it would be a good idea to open it to the public to, to share our research with the wider community. Authors came from different time zones and uh, have different commitment uh, in the summer. So, uh, I want to thank all the contributors to work on the chapters in the past few months and uh, to, uh, to make it possible that we, we, we have this two days uh, event. So what the book is, uh, is about, uh, it is about security, freedom, and the rule of law. It is an understatement to say 2019, was a difficult year for Hong Kong. Depending on one's political perspective, it was a year of hope, a year of desperation, a year of chaos, or a year of crisis. Putting aside our normative positions, 2019 presented an emergency to the central people's government which we are an integral part of. For the Central People's Government, there was a deep crisis in governance in order that Hong Kong was ill-equipped to manage and necessitated a constitutional intervention. That's behind us now. But freedom and the rule of law are enduring concerns for Hong Kong. Rule of law, as it was introduced to and evolved in Hong Kong in the short 180 year history from a colonized territory to a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China has experienced periodical stress tests. External shocks and internal turmoils in difficult, in difficult historical times have put the real rule of law system and corresponding rights and the freedom under stress test. People wondered then, as they do now, whether the system that we built is collapsing, whether the foundation for it is eroding, and whether we are losing the freedom and the security that we treasure dearly. It is said that the national security law has restored law and order and the security to Hong Kong, but it has also created uncertainties, anxieties, and vulnerabilities. They needed to be studied, discussed, and addressed. Hong Kong's rule of law is nothing if not resilient. We are a pragmatic people who can always discover synergies between the larger political order and individual rights and freedom in order to develop a symbiotic relation 
between this highly autonomous city and the core national interests, including security. On such a note, I open this conference on Hong Kong under the national security law. There are two types of emergency powers. One is uh, restorative and the other transformative. A restorative emergency aims to save the pre-existing legal order and the other destroys it and it creates a new one. Where does the national security law stand between the restorative and transformative ends of the spectrum? This is the important question and the answer to it would have a significant impact on the constitutional structure of Hong Kong SAR as we know it. We intend to answer the questions from three perspectives. First, by exploring the constitutional root of the national security law by placing the law in its larger political and constitutional context to assess its constitutionality. Second, the impact it has created and is like to have on the existing legal system and on, on the rights and the freedoms the residents in Hong Kong used to enjoy. And the third, we will discuss the larger impact that law has created in the wider society, including academic freedom, freedom of the media, and so on and so forth. So on that note, I would like to move immediately to the first panel uh, of the conference uh, with the title of Comparative Perspectives. Um, we we'll have uh, three speakers, one discussion. Uh, so each speaker would have about 20 minutes to make their presentation. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Kent Roach. Uh, Kent is Professor of Law and uh, Richard Wilson, Chair of Law and Public Policy at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Kent is a well-known authority on the constitutional law, uh, terrorism, and uh, the uh, uh, ways constitutions approach uh, emergency. So without further ado, uh, I gave the floor to uh, uh, Professor Roach. Hey, thank you very much, Dean, for that generous introduction. And I'd like to say hi uh, to all my colleagues and friends in Hong Kong. Um, I think it's very important for us as academics uh, to go beyond uh, some of the new Cold War narrative uh, that uh, has characterized uh, debates, uh, particularly in liberal democracies, uh, about the new national uh, security law. I think it is important uh, for academics and particularly academics such as myself who uh, live in a liberal democracy and are fortunate to do so, to be humble and honest and not to engage in what uh, representatives of China's foreign ministry uh, claimed were uh, hypocrisy and double standards when the UK and 26 other democracies raised concerns about the national security law in the United Nations Human Rights um, Council. The first part of my paper will outline some ways that the national security law builds on post 9-11 trends uh, that have been encouraged uh, by democracies and, and by the UN uh, 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 Security Council. <clears throat> um, I will conclude that there have indeed been some criticisms of the national security law that are engaged in double standards. No one is perfect and no one has completely clean hands in the security business, uh, particularly after 9-11. <clears throat> after that, the second part of my paper will embrace comparative law methodology that does not simply parse the words and phrases of comparative law, 
in a kind of questionnaire format, but is attentive uh, uh, to their cumulative impact. And as the Dean suggested at the beginning, uh, this will involve not only examining the letter of the new national security law, but attempting as best I can to place it in its broader political, constitutional, and socio-legal uh, context and culture. I will argue uh, in the second part that the cumulative effects of the national security law presents greater threats to the rule of law and a culture of freedom and checks and balances that supports it, more so than even the most illiberal elements of the laws and practices of most liberal democracies. I hope that you find the second half uh, uh, critique uh, not to engage in double standards or hypocrisy because that is certainly not my intent. So let's start uh, with how the law, the national security law builds on many uh, post 9-11 trends towards stricter security laws and stricter practices. So first we see in the law uh, four new broad security offenses, uh, really following the template of post 9-11 uh, uh, security laws, including things like terrorist training, financing, uh, and also reflecting the continued, and in my view, regrettable inability of the international community to agree on a definition of terrorism. And in the wake of that agreement, we have seen in both liberal democracies like the UK, the US and Canada, uh, broad security laws and broad definitions of terrorism. Second, uh, we see uh, in the new national security law, particularly Article 27, a focus on speech associated with terrorism. Uh, this has been a pronounced trend in anti-terrorism laws since the UN Security Council Resolution 1624, which was sponsored by the UK and then Prime Minister Tony Blair. Uh, third, and I think in some ways this may be uh, the most egregious example of double standards in the critique of the NSL is that Article 38 uh, has a rather comparatively mild form of universal jurisdiction uh, that still requires some nexus for someone outside of China or uh, and and the uh, and Hong Kong uh, to have some connection. Uh, to Hong Kong. Many terrorism laws, including the UK's laws, simply assert universal jurisdiction with absolutely no nexus to their domestic country. So that the UK courts have litigated issues such as who is a terrorist in Gaddafi's Libya. And to make matters worse, the United Kingdom uh, Supreme Court in the 2013 Gold case, essentially threw up its hands and said, our definition of terrorism is overbroad, uh, but we really can't do too much to fix it. Uh, fourth, uh, we see uh, a trend to increase police powers. Uh, in my country, uh, after 9-11, new powers of preventive arrests and investigative hearings were introduced. Uh, even stricter powers were introduced in Australia. Um, th there may be some issues, which I will come to in the second part, about the use of regulations as perhaps the main way to expand police powers under the National Security Act, but it is a common feature that police powers and the powers of intelligence agencies have been increased in, uh, since 9-11 in security laws throughout the world. Fifth, we have enhanced punishment, but I would note that there is no death penalty attached to the national security law. 
uh, and that the death penalty is still applicable for some terrorism offenses in the United States. There is provision for reduced uh, punishment for someone who cooperates uh, or becomes an informant. Uh, but again, that is a lesson that we learned from Italian uh, counterterrorism practices in the 1970s. Six, um, I recognize, and as a Canadian, uh, 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 I have a special obligation to recognize that uh, liberal democracies do not generally recognize a right to unilateral succession of any one part of their country. Um, and it's, it's notable here that although many countries in the EU uh, joined the United Kingdom in their initial uh, protest against the national security law, Spain was not one of those. I will, however, return to Spain and the Canadian example. Uh, seven, uh, you see in articles nine and eight uh, uh, echoes uh, of uh, the idea of countering violent extremism, which has really emerged as uh, perhaps the only new idea uh, uh, that we have seen in this decade uh, with respect to countering terrorism and something that is promoted uh, by the UN Security Council, Resolution 2178. Again, uh, this is a British uh, 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 largely a British uh, uh, import and 2015 legislation in Britain uh, imposes uh, countering violent extremism or prevent uh, obligations on a broad range of institutions, including hospitals and universities. Uh, number eight, uh, we see a trend to whole of government uh, security institutions. So the Department of Homeland Security in the United States is an example, uh, but uh, whether it's in Article 12, Article 16, or especially Article 48 of the national security law, you see the creation of new whole of government uh, institutions. And in the, in the case of Article 48, one uh, that is accountable to the central government. Again, uh, central government preemption uh, is not foreign uh, to liberal democracies. So in the United States, many states have their own uh, uh, security laws, terrorism laws, but they are often preempted uh, by federal in, uh, intervention. In Article 34, uh, you see uh, the power to deport someone who has been convicted of the broad new offenses uh, generally, and this really started with UN Security Council Resolution 1373, you have seen in many liberal democracies immigration law being used as a form of security law, even though if you take uh, uh, a security threat seriously, you may be simply uh, um, uh, 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 exporting your security threat uh, to some other country. Uh, 10, and I realize this has been in the news uh, very much, uh, you have limits on trial by jury. Uh, the courts in Hong Kong have recently concluded there is no right to trial by jury. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, the powers in Article 46 are also found uh, in uh, British law uh, stemming from the Diplock courts, but that has been extended in 2017. And indeed the Hong Kong courts that have upheld the recent use of Article 46 have relied on the Hutchings case, a very recent 2019 case from the UK Supreme Court. And then finally in Article 65, you see this idea that the courts are not, do not have a monopoly on the interpretation of the constitution. Uh, this is uh, uh, also an idea 
uh, that is found in liberal democracies. Uh, the, the ability to derogate is one example, but also the American uh, um, uh, practice of coordinate construction uh, praised by eminent and progressive scholars such as Mark Tushnet, uh, who I disagree with uh, on this issue. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think that it would smack of double standards and hypocrisy for someone from a liberal democracy to say that uh, the issue of coordinate construction is itself out of bounds uh, with respect to uh, China and the Standing Committee of the People's Republic of China. So those are, uh, are, are some of the ways uh, that the law builds on post 9-11 trends. Uh, I, I should say that, that you know, I, I, I say this as a positive rather than a normative matter, and much of my scholarship has been critical of these post 9-11 trends in liberal democracies. So let's move on to the more difficult uh, topic. And that is uh, my conclusion uh, based on comparative research that the national security law is not a mild law. Indeed, it is a law that goes well beyond even the most illiberal laws and practices of liberal democracy. So first here, I would start with what I call it in my piece, the meta political crimes of succession and subversion. So uh, succession is criminalized even if force or threat of force is not involved. Subversion is also uh, 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 criminalized if it uses any unlawful means, as opposed to the Article 23 withdrawn bill, which at least required serious criminal means. Subversion is further defined to extend to disrupting or under, undermining government functions. Again, I would say my worry here is not only parsing the language of Article 20 and 23, but looking at the broader political constitutional culture. So in Spain, we have recently seen pardons of uh, of the leaders of the Catalan separatist movement. In Canada, we did declare martial law in 1970 in response to separatist, vi uh, uh, separatist violence. Uh, that was generally seen as an executive overreaction. But by 1976, a party dedicated to the peaceful succession of Quebec was elected the government uh, of Quebec. And in the federal parliament, the Bloc Québécois has several times served as Her Majesty's loyal opposition, even though in many ways they are not loyal to the idea of Canada as a unified nation. Number two, what we see is this idea of an unqualified loyalty to the sovereign. Uh, and this is an older form of security, one that I criticized in the Article 23 withdrawn bill, that seems to demand a sort of loyalty to the state uh, that is, uh, for better or for worse, increasingly anach anachronistic in liberal democracies. So for example, the January 6th insurrection in the United States has still not resulted in seditious conspiracy charges, although it has resulted in many charges, and it has not triggered an attempt to disqualify uh, Trump or others uh, from office, even though that is specifically contemplated for those in, who engage in insurrection and rebellion under the American uh, uh, constitution, which of course is an extremely uh, old constitution. Number two, uh, sorry, number three is we see a uh, targeting of foreign influence that goes well beyond 
uh, waging war or espionage, uh, something that liberal democracies uh, uh, take action against or even covert uh, foreign interference to uh, include various forms of, uh, of, uh, of support. And this has an impact on uh, civil society uh, and the media. And although there have been many post 9-11 abuses of security powers, I think one of the saving graces has been the ability of civil society and media uh, to expose and to criticize. Uh, and this really partakes of something which goes beyond what Jacques Delisle has called a kind of positive legality or what I might call a rule by legal command or rule by law uh, mandate. So accountability and, and checks and balances and a culture of freedom is not simply a matter of uh, positive legal command. It, it, it really involves uh, the operation of these background institutions like the media, like civil society, like a free academy uh, that are really necessary uh, to support uh, freedom. Uh, fourth, um, in my view, uh, Article 10 and 11 uh, goes far beyond uh, any CVE mandate that I see in UK law or even in Article 29 of the People's Republics of China's uh, 2015 uh, counterterrorism law. And again, I find reflected that in the language, I believe it is of Article 10, that this education is not only about national security, uh, but of the obligation to abide by the law. Uh, very much a uh, form of positivist legality or rule by law. We also see here a form of legal nationalism uh, uh, based on uh, China's interests, the banning of songs and slogans, uh, loyalty oath, uh, that really have more similarities on my reading to a 2017 Saudi Arabian uh, counterterrorism law than even the most illiberal, and I do admit that there are illiberal uh, elements of Australian, Canadian, American, or British uh, counterterrorism law. Number five, uh, we have new institutions uh, uh, with respect to the Office uh, for Safeguarding National Security, uh, the Beijing uh, office now operating in Hong Kong, who are on the one hand instructed not to violate rights and freedoms in Article 50, but on the other hand are not subject to the jurisdiction of Hong Kong courts. In uh, number six, uh, in Article 44, uh, we have not only specially designated judges who do sit in security courts like the FISA court or the federal court in Canada, but you have that concept applied to all levels of court, including uh, the final, uh, the, the court of final appeal. And I'm not aware of any uh, similarities. And of course, uh, some of Lady Hale's recent comments in deciding not to seek a second term uh, 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 may be of relevance um, here. Uh, seventh, um, although um, uh, coordinate construction is something uh, that is uh, accepted uh, as our derogation uh, in liberal democracies. Uh, it's generally done uh, in the open and is subject to fierce 
con uh, uh, contestation. So for example, you could see the torture memos uh, 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 of the United States as a form of coordinate construction. But once they were leaked, they were widely demolished uh, and subject to a uh, very, very strong critique. Uh, the problem here is that uh, is not so much an issue of interpretation, but an issue of simply adding to commands uh, and commands that themselves uh, cannot be challenged under the basic law or the international covenant on civil and political rights. So finally, and in conclusion, uh, although the N NSL uh, uh, does uh, pick up and ampl amplify many trends, uh, disturbing trends in my personal view that we see in the security laws and practices of liberal democracies, it goes well beyond uh, those laws, and that this this is uh, an instance where uh, the sum uh, and the chilling effects of the sum are much much greater and much more corrosive than the individual parts, some of which are inspired by laws, illiberal elements of laws in liberal democracies. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, thank you very much, Ken, for this um, very um, nuanced uh, analysis and the critique of the uh, national security law in the uh, context of the uh, post 9-11 uh, uh, event. So I think uh, I have received a, a number of questions already. So what I do is I will defer the all the questions to the Q&A session after all the presentations have been, been done. Um, so the second speaker is um, Professor uh, Turing uh, George. Uh, Turing is a professor uh, at the School of Communication in Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, his academic research centers on freedom of expression and uh, hate uh, uh, propaganda. Um, his professional life has been devoted to journalism practice, education research, and uh, uh, advocacy. Um, uh, as uh, Michael and the discussant, Paul Jim, um, they are all native Singaporeans. So, so we have a very uh, uh, what I should say, that concentrated the discussion on the uh, Singapore uh, comparison. So without further ado, um, the floor is yours, uh, Professor George. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Walin, for uh, welcoming me to this, um, this extremely interesting and of course very timely uh, uh, panel. Uh, I, I'm gonna argue uh, this morning uh, for a uh, political reading of the national security laws implications uh, for Hong Kong's media freedom. Uh, In-depth legal analysis, I think, will only go so far. And I'm not only saying this just to justify my place in this book project as the only author who is not a legal scholar. Uh, I, I do very appreciate uh, your uh, invitation to join uh, this, this uh, august gathering of legal scholars. I'm not one of them. Um, I will use the bulk of my time uh, to uh, develop this idea that the national security law needs to be read through a political lens, uh, and uh, then to develop the second point, that while the NSL introduces the legal possibility of extreme and total control, uh, a comparative perspective uh, suggests that what's more probable is a system um, of selective censorship that I call post-Orwellian authoritarianism. Uh, third, as a Singaporean, as uh, Walling has reminded us, I can never run away from this question. Uh, is today's Singapore, Hong Kong of tomorrow? And I'll suggest that the Singapore model is actually hard to replicate and that Hong Kong is more likely to converge with a far more numerous set of messy, raucous, uh, semi-free, semi-closed media systems around the world. Uh, so first, uh, let's discuss how to read the national security law. 
Uh, from day one, legal analysts have pointed out that the law's wording is vague and overbroad. Uh, Professor Roach has already run us through important ways in which this is true, and I'm sure this will be a running theme uh, in this uh, conference. So at the heart of this controversy, I think, is a mismatch of expectations over how the state should deal with speech that it considers against the public interest, uh, in particular, how to use law. Uh, under the International Civil uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, states can restrict freedom of expression, but restrictions must pass the so-called three-part test to ensure that states do not engage in overkill. Uh, restrictions must not only serve a legitimate purpose, and national security is one of the purposes specified in the ICCPR, but must also be according to clearly written law, but must be necessary and proportionate to achieve the stated legitimate ends. Uh, it is often hard to tailor laws so snugly, and the ICCPR, as well as ICCPR consistent national constitutions, uh, require states to err on the side of freedom. And this means that, in effect, uh, states are often prevented from achieving their goals solely through law and must instead rely on other instruments like education and counter speech. Uh, of course, most states, including many that have ratified the ICCPR, uh, find this a very uh, onerous um, uh, ask. The, the three-part test is far too demanding. Uh, and so they'd rather apply the very simple test of expediency and arm themselves with laws that give them maximum room for maneuver. Uh, and when accused of intending to abuse these powers, uh, these states tend to provide uh, political assurances that they will only use the law for the greater good and that responsible media have nothing to fear. Uh, we've seen this dynamic right here in Hong Kong over the past couple of weeks. The government has uh, tried to reassure Hong Kongers that its actions against Jimmy Lai and Apple Daily had nothing to do with press freedom and was not a sign of things to come for other media. Um, with foreign governments weighing in, the government's denials that last week uh, events have anything to do with press freedom have grown only shriller. And so this issue, like practically all important discussions about Hong Kong these days, has been sucked into the vortex of geopolitics and political polarization. And now since the uh, government's political pledges are not written into law, Hong Kong's media fraternity uh, remain concerned. So the South China Morning Post said in its editorial last Friday, uh, media freedom goes to the city's unique identity, competitiveness and success. In that regard, the government must not use or be seen to be using uh, this case to limit press freedom, including media criticism of bad policies and scrutiny of government performance. There is no question the city is feeling a chilling effect, unquote. Uh, talking to Hong Kongers about events of the past year, I know that many of them uh, find questions about where exactly the red lines are to be incredibly naive. Uh, they think that the only question is how quickly Beijing will implement one country, one system, and impose the mainland's red lines wholesale on the one special administrative region of Hong Kong. Uh, I call it the nuclear option, forgive me for this extremely technical legal language. Uh, <laughs> uh, calling, I think you called it uh, transformative. Yeah? So this is the, the transformative option. Um, it, it can't be discounted. In, in the case of media, this would mean either a communist style, full nationalization of all print and broadcast media or Singapore style discretionary licensing, uh, banning any media that's deemed troublesome and leading only one or two media companies that are easier to supervise. Uh, the internet will be placed behind the great firewall. RTHK would be replaced by CCTV 18 to 20 or whatever. Uh, all journalism schools, including mine, would be closed down or transformed. Uh, now, I have no knowledge of Beijing's intentions, but for the sake of non-Hong Kongers and audience, I will just point out that there is another view circulating, which I think ma matches uh, uh, Hualing's label of a uh, restorative uh, approach. Uh, I call it uh, a controlled burn. Um, it says, no, what we are seeing now is an orgy of retribution against Hong Kongers uh, who dared to use sovereign Chinese territory to invite Western powers into what should have been a private family quarrel. So um, according to this control burn theory, uh, Beijing wants to teach Hong Kong a lesson once and for all and to call the protesters bluff. 
If we burn, you burn with us. No, Hong Kong will burn alone. Now, if this interpretation is correct, then once the city is cleansed of the main forces behind the 2019 unrest, uh, then Beijing may be happy to find a new equilibrium that is different from the past, but still uh, qualitatively different from the mainland. There will be no uh, need for the nuclear option. Uh, so which of these scenarios apply is a matter of uh, political judgment, since we don't really have much access into the inner workings or inner mind of the, of the party. Uh, in, in most jurisdictions that uh, don't have guaranteed freedoms, uh, journalists use their experience to gauge if there is in fact room to take calculated risks. Uh, Hong Kong, however, is in a brand new situation with no precedence to guide us. Uh, so I think it helps to look elsewhere since the authoritarian condition is obviously nothing new to the world's media. And this brings me to my second theme. Uh, right now, our picture of authoritarianism is colored by the memory of totalitarianism, uh, often filtered uh, through George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, written in the 1940s in the shadow of Stalin and Hitler. Uh, Orwell, of course, described a regime of absolute conformity, zero tolerance for alternative ways of thinking, maintained by routine violence and fear. Uh, now, post-Orwellian authoritarianism, in contrast, is something I explore in a chapter in my forthcoming book, Red Lines, which is a global study of uh, contemporary censorship that will be out this August. Uh, I point out that resilient and consolidated authoritarian regimes like China and Turkey have tried uh, to rely less on bans and jail terms and more on indirect and invisible methods of media manipulation, including using the economic levers to inculcate self-censorship, uh, because these are more sustainable and less costly in the long run. Now, this is not an original insight. Uh, by the 1980s in the Soviet bloc, Miklos Harasti observed the difference between primitive totalitarianism of the Stalinist period and mature state socialism of his times, where sticks are exchanged for carrots. Uh, around the same time, the ruling People's Action Party in my country was developing the art of uh, using just enough force to get the job done without provoking uh, levels of moral outrage around which opponents could mobilize. Uh, in my own writing 10 years ago, I call this calibrated coercion. Uh, by the mid 2010s, media freedom monitors were reporting that modern authoritarian states were substituting violent repression with stealth censorship. Most of the academic work on Chinese censorship has come to similar conclusions. Uh, so the notion that authoritarian regimes do not try to maximize repression is now mainstream in political science and media studies. Uh, theorists suggest various reasons for this. Uh, here are just a few of them. Uh, first, uh, states have moderated their expectations and have come to understand that total information control is costly and probably unachievable. Uh, second, unlike Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, today's authoritarian leaders tend not to have a revolutionary utopian visions that require the vocal support of the entire population. Uh, brainwashing is out, distraction and depoliticization is in. As long as they leave politics to the state, people are allowed to consume and produce media that amuse them in myriad ways. Uh, third, uh, resorting to spectacular and forceful repression can backfire. It can cause public outrage around which opponents can mobilize. Uh, coercion that is intended to inhibit people can instead increase their resolve. Uh, fourth, an excessively punitive system uh, results in such widespread cover-ups that even rulers end up in the dark about what is happening on the ground. Uh, in a market economy, of course, businesses cannot survive if only good news is allowed to circulate. Uh, note that this theory of uh, self-restraint on the part of authoritarian regimes uh, is not premised on the presence of leaders who want to do the right thing. It assumes only that authoritarian states are learning organizations capable of doing the smart thing. Uh, states are not averse to the occasional use of direct and coercive censorship but extreme measures are not necessarily the preferred or most routine form of control. Uh, political scientists have tried constructing elaborate models uh, to predict uh, the uh, you know, likelihood of repression, uh, and they throw in various factors such as the levels of dissent, 
regime stability, civil unrest, foreign scrutiny, and so on. Uh, overall, though, I think it's easier for historians uh, to look back and explain why an authoritarian regime acted or didn't act in the way than it did, uh, than for political scientists to predict their behavior. Uh, but what we do know is that regimes have a wide repertoire of methods to choose from. Uh, torture, murder, bannings, attract headlines and international condemnation, but precisely because these more violent methods get unwanted attention, states often use less extreme legal and administrative tools to discipline media, including civil suits, tax probes, and so on. Uh, even less visible are economic, technological, and populist tools working with the market, with algorithms, and with online and offline mobs. Uh, regimes also vary the breadth of their interventions. We associate the uh, Orwellian paradigm with mass indoctrination. Everyone is expected to be an ideological foot soldier of the revolution. All media, even art, culture, entertainment, must not only refrain from political dissent, but must actively generate propaganda. Neutrality is not an option. Uh, such totalizing visions are now rare. There is strong censorship of organizers and producers of dissent, but the masses are mostly left alone to consume what in the past would be considered counter-revolutionary or heretical material. Uh, regimes tend to exercise strong control over the most influential mass media, such as uh, free-to-air TV, uh, especially in the local language, but are willing to allow niche media, such as English language business press, more room. Uh, so censorship can be arrayed in a matrix like this, uh, and while we should never underestimate the capacity or willingness of despots to use violence, it is equally unwise to underestimate their intelligence and sophistication. Uh, they know that what often goes under the radar of media freedom monitors and the media themselves is economic carrots and sticks that are less violative of uh, human rights, but can ultimately be more damaging to the public's right to receive information. Uh, so in the late uh, 2010s, uh, Turkey was the world's number one jailer of media workers ahead of even China in absolute terms. But if you speak to Turkish journalists, um, some will tell you that the regime has done even more damage to Turkey's media independence through economic means. Uh, the government tamed two major newspapers in 2018 by uh, pursuing their owner with uh, tax evasion charges related to his non-media holdings. The publisher finally gave in, selling his media properties to a pro-regime corporation. Uh, the same has happened in the Philippines. And one recent uh, study found that journalists in the Philippines were more worried about economic and other stealth methods of control than about the arrests and other threats that tend to attack, attract international attention. Uh, in this slide, I have placed victimless censorship in quotation marks because, of course, it's not truly victimless. Because even if no media owners or media workers are hurt, the public loses. Uh, and you need to remember that freedom of expression is not a right that belongs only to speakers. It also includes the right to receive. Uh, so if it results in citizens not being able to partake of the full range of information and ideas they need for democratic self-government, censorship through the market is a rights issue. Uh, bringing Hong Kong into this picture, what obviously worries journalists about the NSL is that the letter of the law seems to allow for extreme and mass interventions, uh, turning all media into tools of patriotic education. Uh, so far, the NSL has been used in a targeted way, though, uh, mainly at the cost of Apple Daily. Uh, but this is only the first year, so understandably, media are on tenterhooks, wondering if the authorities will use the NSL maximally and uh, less discriminatingly. Uh, what censorship studies tell us, though, is that we should also expect various other threats to media freedom, which, while less spectacular, may be more pernicious. Uh, I should highlight in particular the administrative actions not involving the NSL that have already taken uh, been taken to tame RTHK, Hong Kong's public broadcaster. Uh, actions that have received a small fraction of the attention that Apple Daily has been given, but are arguably no less significant for the future of Hong Kong's media environment. Uh, in, in preparation for a webinar we organized at my school last week, uh, we put together this uh, five-page fact sheet on incidents over the past year, and it shows how wide is the array of threats media are subject to uh, many based on powers that pre-existed 
the NSL. Uh, I'll circulate this after uh, my remarks. Uh, the NSL has had indirect effects as well, which are important. It is a powerful symbolic statement that emboldens radical pro-Beijing elements to harass and threaten liberal institutions and individuals outside of the legal arena. Uh, this is reminiscent of the effect of blasphemy law in many countries. It incites extremists to engage in acts of vigilante justice to protect the honor of their chosen creed. Uh, finally, let me turn to Singapore. Uh, well, I don't mean to brag, but I think my country is the world's most advanced case of post Orwellian authoritarianism. Uh, it's not surprising that the country tends to pop up in these discussions about Hong Kong. Uh, it is an extreme outlier in data relating social economic development and media freedom. Uh, so it no doubt gives the government here hope that Hong Kong can similarly defy the West's conventional wisdom. Uh, so is Hong Kong heading Singapore's way? Uh, I suspect that yes, Singapore will be like Singapore, uh, uh, Hong Kong will be like Singapore, a prominent outlier, uh, uh, sorry, outlier in charts relating economic development and media freedom. But I do not think that Hong Kong will be able to reach uh, Singapore's current condition. Uh, what makes Singapore the preeminent post Orwellian authoritarian state is not just that it is unfree, with, for example, no investigative journalism on moon, because the world is full of unfree societies, but that it is practically devoid of open resistance and therefore very rarely requires coercive interventions by the state. Uh, this, the substitution of direct and coercive censorship with cell censorship was achieved over decades. It required a scorched earth strategy to remove once and for all uh, any oppositional media in the 1960s and 70s. This was followed by new press laws that allowed behind the scenes in, uh, intervention and that guided the media towards economic targets, after which coercion was highly calibrated and often unnecessary. Hong Kong starting conditions are very different. Singapore leaders are forced to be more in tune with public sentiment, not only because we have the vote, but also because of our small size. Now it's hard to believe this, but Wherever he is in Singapore, a minister would never be more than 50 kilometers away from any other part of the country. Hong Kong's rulers are a little more insulated from their own mismanagement of any crisis and therefore more likely to respond in a clumsy and uncalibrated way, just like most other uh, semi-free, uh, semi-closed large countries around the world. Um, even post-NSL, Hong Kong authorities still don't have the discretionary licensing powers that the PAP started out with. Starting conditions matter. The ability to control access to the media industry was, I think, the trump card that enabled the PAP to co-opt news media in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, finally, the PAP consolidated its performance legitimacy during decades of relatively easy growth in East Asia. I think it is much harder now for governments, any government, uh, to persuade citizens to exchange their freedoms for social mobility. So, so for all these reasons, I cannot see Hong Kong becoming the exceptional oasis of calm that Singapore is. Uh, it is likely to be far messier, more contentious, um, you know, with uh, requiring uh, more frequent, uh, direct and uh, forceful uh, repression by the state and often provoking more vocal resistance from the ground. In other words, it will be like uh, the vast majority of semi-free, semi-closed media systems around the world, uh, and Singapore will remain, uh, keep its pride of place as the ultimate uh, post-Orwellian authoritarian society on the planet. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So um, we, we have one view now on, on the uh, uh, Singapore-Hong Kong comparison. Um, uh, let's just hold the comments for a while and move to the uh, uh, the, um, uh, the second paper on, on Singapore by my uh, uh, colleague, uh, Professor Michael Hall. Uh, Michael was dean of the faculty uh, between 2014 to 2019. Um, he's a, a specialist in criminal law evidence, criminal procedure, 
and um, uh, taught in um, the Singapore National University Faculty of Law for decades before we invite him over as uh, as dean um, of uh, our faculty. So now the floor is uh, yours, Michael, uh, when you are ready. Yeah, just a second uh, to start the slideshow. Okay. Uh, yes, I arrived in uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, two, was it two months before Occupy Central, <laughs> and um, it hasn't stopped since then. <laughs> and uh, although I have stopped, falling is actually Okay, um, uh, okay what, what I shall uh, do in this uh, uh, twenty minutes? Yeah, it's uh, it was a, it was a difficult paper or chapter to. to to write because uh, I think uh, uh, Charion has, has pointed out some of the problems of, of comparing the two. So what, what I'm going to do is uh, to take the, 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 the lawyer's way out and, and, and look, look primarily at the law. Um, and um, what, what I did uh, uh, was to look at the showcase of uh, uh, Singapore's um, uh, uh, national security law, which is the Internal Security Act. And within the Internal Security Act, something called uh, detention without trial. That when, when we, we talk about national security in, uh, in uh, Singapore, inevitably uh, the, the ISA uh, comes up. And when people talk about the ISA, they don't mean it, any of the other provisions except detention without trial. And uh, so I'm gonna compare that showcase uh, measure with, um, let's see. I'm going to com compare that showcase measure uh, in Singapore with um, the national security law of Hong Kong. Um, uh, so it is a, a very limited comparison. I know a, a, a lot more goes on outside of the ISA, a lot more goes on outside of national security law, but I'm going to, to, to make it manageable here. Just, just, just look at these two, right? Um, uh, uh, the, the first striking thing is that uh, the, the national security law is almost a year old. Yeah. Uh, 30th June 2020. The Internal Security Act of the ISA of Singapore is, on my calculation, uh, taking into account the, 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 the earlier versions of it, at least 73 years old. Um, and it has never stopped operating uh, uh, since then, 73 years old, 1948. And uh, it has been uh, proven so useful yeah, to generations of, of, of uh, government officials that uh, it, it is now seen to be not just necessary but or not just uh, desirable but essential yeah, to uh, the, the national security of Singapore yeah. now um, essentially yeah, the, the the two strategies yeah, the NSL and the ISA yeah uh, uh, the difference is this yeah right um, the uh, the NSL uh, adopts what I call a modified criminal process. It is still a criminal process. There's a charge, there's a trial, there's a prosecution, there is a sentence, you'll go to jail, um, uh, just like any other um, uh, uh, criminal process. Yeah, right. Uh, and we will come to the, diff the, 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 the modifications yeah, in, a, in, a, in a short while. Yeah. Um, Singapore's ISA, however, um, is radically different. Yeah. It is, um, uh, to a lawyer at least, yeah. it, is a, it is executive detention, detention without trial. Yeah. There is no charge, there is no trial, there is no sentence. It is an executive power uh, to detain um, effectively indefinitely, detain you uh, for as long as uh, the, the, the government feels that you are still a threat. Um, so um, uh, this is the essential difference between the two. Yeah. Um, and uh, in a sense, you can see it yeah, in, the, in, in the legal structure of the two laws. Yeah. Uh, the, the NSL, uh, uh, in fact, starts off, yeah, starts off with a with, with a ringing declaration for, of respect for human rights, compliance with the ICCPR, uh, 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 of the basic law, and so on. Yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, 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 but the 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 ISA um, uh, has to be uh, validated yeah, through Article Article One Four Nine of the Singapore Constitution, which um, 
expressly allows the ISA to derogate from a number of uh, fundamental freedoms, which are, would otherwise make the ISA unconstitutional. Yeah. So in other words, it is a clear exception, a clear derogation. Yeah. So you can see that the, the, even, even the rhetoric is different, right? The NSL um, uh, uh, uses language of rights, yeah. right? Whether or not uh, they are faithful to it is, is another issue, yeah. but, but that's what they, they uh, it, it says it does. Yeah. Um, the ISA has no such pretense. Right? It is it is nothing but a derogation from um, uh, 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 of normal yeah, constitutional rights. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, uh, this is the the, the, the the central difference between the, the two. Yeah. Um, and um, the compared to the the the, the NSL's uh, uh, traditional criminal process. Yeah, um, uh, for those of us who are not familiar with the with the, the, the ISA detention system of, of Singapore, Singapore yeah, um, it, it is essentially an executive power yeah, uh, exercised by an, an internal security department. Uh, it is a, a government department which is devoted to, to doing this, yeah, uh, over, uh, overseen by by the Minister of Home Affairs, and of course above him will be the the the, the cabinet. Yeah. Um, there is um, the uh, uh, institution of an advisory board, yeah. right? Um, and um, but uh, and um, the the government has on occasion uh, used the the existence of the advisory board to partially uh, justify yeah, the uh, the Internal Security Act. Yeah, but uh, it, everybody can see yeah, that it is nowhere near a criminal trial, yeah. right? Um, um, Subject to voluntary disclosure, uh, all the proceedings are, are secret. Right? The government can, of course, choose to disclose parts of it, but uh, the 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 the, um, the default is is uh, secrecy. So everything from the uh, from the contents of the, the detention order to the proceedings in the advisory board to the arguments made, the evidence thereof, the the even the um, the report of the advisory board yeah, are secret. Um, um, and more than that, the, the, the advice of the advisory board is not binding on the government. It is, as the name suggests, uh, advisory. Um, there's only one situation in which it, it would have a bite, which is if the president concurs with the advisory board against the, the wishes of the government. That, that is a pretty unusual uh, situation. Uh, it's never happened. To my knowledge, to our knowledge before. So, um, although there is such a thing as an advisory board, which is, you know, something like a, a, a trial, it's very far from it. Yeah. So, um, uh, this is the essential difference here yeah, between the two showcase uh, uh, national security measures. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, and then I looked at the um, the 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 sort of things in the, the national security law which are bothering people. Yeah. Um, um, there's a whole bunch of things, yeah, but uh, um, these are the things that, that seem to have come up in the in, in the press and uh, in, in the uh, sort of public discussion that uh, in the in the past year. Um, now, um, and what I'm going to what, what I, I'm going to do is uh, I don't know, yeah, it sounds pretty silly, but uh, I thought I had to do it anyway, yeah, to compare it with the. The, 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 the Singapore equivalent, yeah. okay. Um, so it, it so people are, are, are uh, very excited about the the offences which uh, the, the NSL has created, right? And in particular, things like uh, inciting secession, right? Which in the past I think um, was not a crime or was not clearly a crime, okay. Um, um, and uh, things like uh, the offence of subversion, yeah, through seriously undermining the functions of of government, yeah. right? And this uh, uh, came to the spotlight because of the prosecutions in the context of uh, primaries yeah, held uh, by the, the opposition. Yeah. Um, things like the, 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 the offense of collusion with external elements, yeah, right? And this is the, the, the sort of the, the, the sin of Apple, apparently the sin of Apple daily, yeah, which is they, 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 are, they are supposed to have colluded with external elements to do things which are adverse to Hong Kong or or, or China, right? And um, the um, of course the, the 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 problem is that um, uh, of distinguishing between the crime of collusion with external elements and what human rights 
advocates do <laughs> normally, uh, uh, is, is, the, the line is, is, is very far from clear. So um, uh, uh, the, the, the lines to be drawn, right, the, the definitions of these offences, what they cover and what they don't cover, uh, has caused a problem uh, in, in, in the NSL uh, interpretation here. Um, and, um, but if you compare it with um, the Internal Security Act, uh, you will see something even broader. Because the power of the government in, in Singapore to detain you uh, is based on the, the necessity of preventing you from acting in any, any manner prejudicial to the security of Singapore, full stop. There's no definition beyond that. Right? So um, uh, if the government, whatever the government deems to be sufficiently prejudicial to the security of Singapore, if they believe that you are going to act against it, that's it. Yeah? There is no no need even to talk about secession or subversion or collusion in specifically, right? So again, uh, uh, whatever the, the, the uh, uh, apprehensions the, the NSL might, might be causing, right? Like, uh, technically, the ISA should be causing even more yeah? uh, uh, of such apprehensions, yeah? right? The, sec the second thing about the NSL, which I think has uh, attracted attention are these, what I call specialized parallel institutional arrangements, right? So you have, for example, in the police force, a special department to deal with uh, um, uh, national, national security cases. In the Department of Justice, uh, which uh, uh, handles prosecutions, you have the National Security Division, which, uh, uh, which handles this. And um, uh, as uh, Taryn mentioned just now, um, the, the, uh, the, sorry, not, not Taryn, uh, um, uh, Kent yeah, <laughs> mentioned, uh, the, the, there is, this um, uh, core of national security approved or appointed judges. Um, so you have, you have a parallel system, a specialized system where, where, where only particular people um, can do these things and, and, and they are separated from the rest. Um, um, uh, okay, uh, now, at least, at least um, you can say that they are, you know, the, 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 the people in the Department of National Security of the police force are policemen. The people in the National Security Division of the Department of Justice are prosecutors here. The approved judges are judges here, right? They are not anybody else here, except that they are, they are, they are a, a, a subset of, of the regular judges here. In, under the Eternal Security Act, the ISA, however, um, the one deciding body, here, as I mentioned just now, is the essentially the Internal Security Department and the supervising minister. Right. Um, neither the Internal Security Department or any of the members inside it, or the or the Minister of Home Affairs, they are, they are not uh, they are not regular police. Right? They are not in the in the uh, Attorney General's chambers, which handles prosecutions in uh, in uh, uh, in Singapore. And of course, they are not members of the judiciary. Right? I, I just pause to mention that it is it is a tradition for the advisory board yeah, to be chaired by uh, a, a member of the judiciary. Right, um, but um, that, how that, that, that works out is, is unknown. Yeah? We, we can't study it because we don't have any information on it apart from that. Yeah? So um, um, uh, uh, for those who, who think that the, these parallel systems are, are, are ominous and that they're stacked against the, the, the defendant, right? at, at, at least yeah, they, are, they are actually uh, uh, people who, who do such things normally. Yeah? Um, but under the Internal Security Act, um, no police, no prosecutors, no judges are involved. Yeah? It is purely executive, right? Um, uh, so it, one ought, I suppose, logically to be more, to be more alarmed by that yeah, than by the, by the Hong Kong's parallel system. Um, and finally, yeah, uh, uh, some of the things that uh, have, have been in the press, yeah, things like uh, the presumption against bail and uh, the Secretary of Justice's discretion to avoid the jury trial. Well, as far as bail is concerned, yeah, right, of course, there's no, if there's no trial, there's no, no question of bail, right? So that, that's out. Um, but jury trials, well, Singapore, uh, under the ISA, there is no trial at all. Yeah. So jury or no jury. Yeah. But even if there were a trial, yeah, Singapore has had no jury trials for many, many decades. Singapore abolished the jury trial um, in 1960 something. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, if these measures of the, the bail and, and, and uh, uh, jury trial measures uh, 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 want to alarm you, yeah, then 
under the ISA, you should logically be even more alarmed. Um, yeah, oh, that's pretty small. <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't even read it myself here. Uh, uh, okay, uh, how am I going to get can, can I see it here? Anyway, um, uh, I can't remember it actually, but uh, so yeah, uh, the the point really uh, is that um, if you look at the the, the these two showcase uh, measures here, yeah, right? Um, it, you should be much more alarmed with Singapore's Internal Security Act uh, than uh, Hong Kong's national security law. Yeah. Um, but um, from from what I read in the press, yeah, uh, that that is not the case, yeah, right? And I, well, I, I know, of course, uh, there is this new Cold War thing going on. Yeah, so um, uh, 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 Hong Kong is likely to, to attract more adverse uh, publicity from from the West. But but even taking that into account, yeah, um, uh, the uh, yeah, uh, you don't hear the same amount of uh, 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 trepidation, apprehension about about Singapore's uh, uh, national security measures here. Yeah. But you do hear a lot about uh, uh, Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm trying. I made the mistake of uh, having such a right. Yeah. So why? Yeah. Why? Why is that so? Um, one reason, I suppose, is novelty. Right. Uh, Singapore's um, uh, system has been there yeah, for a very long time, yeah, and people who have who want to criticize it ha have have criticized it years ago, um, and. Uh, 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 Hong Kong, however, is not supposed to be like this. Uh, and uh, whatever has happened is um, uh, one year old. So obviously, more news will be there. Right. To say that Singapore is illiberal is not news. Right. Uh, but to say that Hong Kong has become illiberal is. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a novelty element there. Um, but I think it goes beyond that. Right. And it goes beyond that. And um, um, I'm going to look at in what sense here. Yeah. Now, um, First, in the practice of, of these two, two laws, yeah, um, um, there is a perception, there is a perception in, 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 in Singapore, in a very widespread one, that um, the use of the Internal Security Act against sort of political opposition yeah, um, um, had its high watermark in, the, in 1987 yeah, with the um, arrest of the so-called Marxist conspirators. Yeah. Um, and um, this was it seemed to be a high watermark because it, 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 it was subsequently revealed, yeah, for example, that uh, a, a very prominent uh, cabinet minister in Singapore actually resigned from the cabinet in protest yeah, um, uh, of these arrests. Yeah. So, um, and the trend since, that, since then has been to use it, uh, not to, has been not to use it yeah, for, um, uh, for political purposes. Yeah. It, instead, what, what it has been used for in, since then, yeah, uh, uh, essentially, uh, what I call uh, religiously motivated terrorism. Yeah. Uh, we used, uh, in a very discriminatory way, to call it Islamic terrorism, but now it appears that uh, there are also Christian terrorists. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, uh, it, it is not a, a religion specific, but uh, it, it has been used primarily in that context. Yeah. Okay, and um, that, that seems to be. Although that, 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 that is still, yeah, that is still uh, apprehension about any use of the Internal Security Act. Yeah. Um, but there that, that, that seems to be um, a, 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 a thinking that, um, that perhaps the, the use of detention without trial in such religiously uh, motivated terrorism cases is not unreasonable. Right? And the government has, has, has come out to say that um, uh, um, they, are, they are not charging them and trying them in court because they, they don't want to, to inflame the some sort of religious racial uh, passions that, that, that might uh, otherwise be disturbed by, by such a prosecution. And I can also think of uh, uh, benign motives like uh, they, they, they actually don't want to to um, uh, put too much of a spotlight on, on these um, uh, uh, terrorists yeah, uh, uh, because um, they, they do want them to be rehabilitated and re, you know, reintegrated in society. Yeah. So to, to, to put them to the glare of a, a criminal prosecution yeah, is going to be against that kind of, of thing. Yeah. So th there is this idea that, 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 that there is um, uh, an element, or more than an element, yeah, a core of reasonableness yeah, in the use of um, uh, 
preventive detention in, uh, in those cases, as opposed to the, 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 the so-called Marxist conspirators in 1987. Right? Um, so in other words, uh, uh, what happened in 1987 is uh, many Singaporeans would consider to be unimaginable today. Uh, I, I remember when I, when I, when I taught in, in Singapore, yeah, uh, when I recounted the 1987 uh, events, my students' jaws dropped. They could not believe that such a thing could happen in Singapore. Uh, uh, but it did happen, and uh, and I mentioned this only to, to 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 show that there is a perception that there has been a tempering, a moderation of the the, the use of such coercive powers. Um, uh, um, now, it, in Hong Kong, however, fresh one year, and uh, uh, all the problems that we see are in fact active, real. Right? Uh, they are being used against real people, real newspapers, uh, real opposition politicians here. Yeah. So um, there's active uh, uh, investigation and prosecution yeah, for, for all these uh, things. Yeah. There's active denial of bail, active denial of uh, uh, trial by jury. Yeah. So you can see that, that, that uh, you know, Singapore is seen to be improving. Hong Kong is seen to, to be, well, going the other, the other direction. Um, now, um, this, of course, is a, it, it's only about the national security law. A lot, a lot is happening uh, beyond the national security law. Yeah, I think that plays a part too. Um, you cannot see the, the, the NSL or the ISA in, in isolation. Yeah. In the general political context, right, um, um, I think there's also a perception that the, the governance or government of Singapore yeah, um, uh, is moderating and tempering it, it, itself. Right? Um, I know, I know uh, Charian has a as a more ominous interpretation of that. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, uh, the, the general perception, right, um, uh, for people who don't think too hard, perhaps, yeah, is, is that um, uh, uh, there has been a softening, uh, 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 dare I say, liberalization yeah, of the way that uh, Singapore, uh, Singapore is covered. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the one in, uh, comparison which I, I, I make is this. Yeah. In the elections, yeah, in the elections of, uh, uh, was it 20, was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, 2020. Yeah. Um, the it is very very rare for the opposition to win anything uh, in, in any elections in Singapore. Yeah. But in 2020, it, it won its second group representation constituency. Uh, the opposition managed to unseat uh, 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 a group representation group representation cons, uh, constituency consisting of a minister, yeah. um, uh, and. Um, what was the reaction of the of the People's Action Party? Right, um, the reaction, in fact, surprised a number of people here. Yeah. What the? Okay, that's just the just uh, and uh, it, it surprised a number of people. And uh, uh, what um, uh, the Prime Minister did was to set up the office of the leader of the opposition and gave funds and a new office and whatever, yeah, uh, to help him do his work. Yeah. Uh, I just compare that with what what. Um, uh, uh, the Prime Minister's father uh, said uh, uh, in the 1990s when the when the PAP's share of the votes was uh, was dropping, he threatened to change the one man one vote system. Yeah, and um, he 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 said that those who voted against the the uh, the, the PAP uh, would would live to regret it. Yeah. So I think that that is the kind of uh, difference that, that that we see in Hong Kong, as we all know. Yeah, I, I won't go into just it's just a, a sentence here. Yeah. Um, the general political climates, again, seems to be going the other way. And uh, there are a lot of things that are going on uh, from the, the sort of elimination of the prosecution to the, the media developments to, 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 to a whole bunch of uh, uh, things that are going on, which seems to be going in the other direction. Um, yeah, uh, just a minute. Okay, yeah, um, I, I, I will just... Uh, 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 skip uh, this point yeah, um, uh, in the interest of time. Yeah. And perhaps uh, 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 go to the last slide, which is, um, uh, again, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing to, to write because so, so what, yeah, right? Um, uh, and I was just thinking, um, uh, uh, are there lessons and, uh, uh, and that sort of thing? And uh, I, I, I thought of two, I thought of two, yeah, one, um, which is, I suppose, a, a lesson addressed to the government. That um, uh, if people think that uh, Hong Kong has died because of the NSL, yeah, well, I suppose Singapore's mes message could be that there is life after death. 
right? Um, it could be that in time to come, there will be moderation, tempering, and uh, the situation uh, will improve if, if the, um, the use of the national security law yeah, is handled uh, correctly. Um, and um, to another audience, which is, uh, what about people who are concerned about rights and, uh, and activism in Hong Kong? And um, I think the, 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 the lesson may be that um, you may just have to be patient, wait for the right time, small steps, uh, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, not so much, a, you know, uh, give me liberty or give me death kind of uh, situation. Yeah. Not, uh, it, not all or nothing, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it's a long process here. Yeah. Patient, hard work, small steps yeah. but the idea is to 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 to, to keep the um, uh, the flame alive thank you michael for, for offering the uh, uh the psychology of uh, national security law it's a nice comparison um i'm sure there will be uh, uh discussions so if um the members of the audience um um have any question please uh just sent the question through the Q and A uh, um, uh, system we're having. So, um, finally, we have uh, 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 our um, uh, Professor Po Jian Yat to give uh, comments on the three papers. Po uh, Jian is um, a professor of our faculty and um, is also graduate from uh, NUS and. Uh, uh, Singaporean himself, I think, uh, uh, is, is a, a leading constitutional scholar writing um, the comparative constitution in Hong Kong uh, and um, Asia. So, for um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean. Uh, can everyone hear me? It's a great privilege to be discussing three outstanding papers that are original and insightful and balanced. And this is a great privilege to have an early glimpse of what is shaping up to be a fantastic volume put together by Dean Fu and Dean Hall. As a Singaporean, it's really quite inconceivable to me that any law school in Singapore will put together a conference that's exclusively on the NSL of Singapore that is open to the public with foreign nationals speaking at it. So kudos to Dean Ho and, and Dean uh, Fu for putting this together for us. I'll start with Professor Roach's paper, where he compares our Hong Kong NSL with the Western equivalent. As he rightly points out, the NSL has echoes of illiberal elements of security laws and court rulings found in liberal democracies. For example, liberal democracies, including Canada, Spain, and the US, do not recognize a right to secession. Under the NSL, offenses must be targeted at Hong Kong, but the UK's NSL has an even broader, wider universal application. The UK government has prosecuted as terrorists those who fought against Gaddafi in Libya. The Hong Kong's NSL allows the Secretary of Justice to dispense with jury trials. But the military commissions by the US at Guantanamo Bay are composed by US military officers. So it is very true that there are elements of hypocrisy when the Western port calls the Chinese cattle black. But as Professor Roach also rightly points out, the real mischief of Hong Kong's NSL is how this law attempts to undermine the independence of the courts, the legislature, the press, the pro-democracy movement, the academy and civil society, all institutions that have mitigated the most illiberal features of the security laws found in other liberal democracies. In Hong Kong, the security apparatus can be immune from the rule of law the government can designate specific judges to hear NSL cases. And the national security education can be imposed in schools from primary to universities. All these are unheard of in liberal democracies. 
Furthermore, in Hong Kong, the organization of informal election primary can constitute state subversion. Elected lawmakers can be disqualified for not being patriotic. These two elements are unheard of, not only in liberal democracies, they are unheard of even in Singapore, which is not a liberal democracy. So what can Hong Kong courts do about these draconian features of the law? Ken's solution, which I wholeheartedly agree with, is for our courts to practice common law constitutionalism or dialogic judicial review. I will discuss this in my panel tomorrow, so I should elaborate upon it. Kant is one of the earliest prophets of this judicial methodology, and my views have been completely shaped by his over the years. Kant's solution, which I echo, pun intended, is for courts to use a series of interpretive remedies to read down the draconian effects of the NSL. For how comparative courts have done this, I highly commend Ken's new book, Remedies for Human Rights Violations, a two-track approach to supranational and national law, which has just been published by Cambridge Univers uh, University Press a few months ago. For how Hong Kong courts should apply such remedial techniques, I will discuss this in my panel tomorrow. So do come back. Sharon George and Michael Hall's papers both compare Hong Kong with Singapore. The former compares the two cities' media freedom, or lack thereof, and the latter compare their respective NSL. First, on media freedom. According to the 2021 World, freedom, world Press Freedom Index, Hong Kong is ranked number 80 in the world out of 160 jurisdictions surveyed. Singapore is 160 in the world. And sum up proving this point, the Singapore print and broadcast media did not mention this fact about Singapore's ranking in any of their coverage. Only the freer online media picked this up. As pointed out by Professor George, Singapore practices what he artfully calls calibrated coercion. Right, the Singapore Newspaper Act requires a person to first obtain a license before he or she can print, publish, or circulate a newspaper in Singapore. And this license can be refused or withdrawn by the government at any time in his or her discretion. Furthermore, any newspaper that publishes in Singapore must create two classes of shares, an ordinary share and a management share. And each management share holder has 200 times the voting rights of an ordinary shareholder over any resolution, over the appointment or dismissal of any director or staff member of any newspaper in Singapore. And that former share or and the management share can only be owned by a Singapore citizen or corporation that's been approved by the government. Imagine if the Hong Kong government had, can hold 200 times the voting rights of any shareholder over any resolution concerning the appointment or dismissal of any staff member in any newspaper in Hong Kong. With this power, there will be no need to freeze any assets or close any media down. In recent years, the Singapore government has further expanded its re re regulatory control over expressive conduct to cyberspace. In 2019, Singapore Parliament passed the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manip Manipulation Act, which empowers the ministers to issue executive directions against fake news. These directions may require statement makers to either correct their statements amend them at the government's chosen response or remove those news altogether. I will not be surprised if similar laws are now on the way for Hong Kong. However, compared to Hong Kong, the Singapore government is more mindful of public opinion. And let me quote from Professor George here, which I think is very insightful, right? So he says, 
the Singapore Republic's elections, though certainly not free, are sorry, certainly not fair, are free enough to result in the occasional ouster of cabinet ministers. Hence, the PAP's increasingly sophisticated practice of targeting only a small number of dissidents for visible coercion while using economic and ideological means to encourage the vast majority of citizens, including most working journalists, to believe that it rules to the consent of the government, close quotations. Right. Now, turning to Professor Hall's paper, where he compares Singapore's ISA with Hong Kong's NSL. One obvious difference is that Singapore's ISA was drafted against communists. Hong Kong's NSL was drafted by communists. So, but while Singapore's NSA was intended to be used against communism in the 1960s, it is now largely used today as a tool against religious radicals. Though there has been a recent detention under the ISA of a Singaporean man who is believed to be a Chinese spy. The draconian features of Hong Kong's NSL is well known, but ominous as Hong Kong's NSL may be, one should note that the Singapore's ISA goes even further. Indefinite preventive detention without trial is authorized in Singapore if the government is satisfied that the detention is necessary to prevent anyone acting in any manner prejudicial to the security of Singapore or to the maintenance of public order or essential services. And the Singapore judiciary can only review any governmental non-compliance with the procedures laid out in the Act. In Singapore, there is no judicial trial of the detainee's guilt. No open or closed door hearings, period. I mean, no open or closed door trial, period. But in recent years, the Singapore government has also exercised remarkable restraint and transparency in the exercise of its powers under the ISA. At least remarkably restrained and transparent for an authoritarian government. So time would tell how far the Hong Kong government wants to go with the NSL. And what should Hong Kong judges do? I will close with a, uh, 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 with, uh, a paragraph from Professor Hall's article, which I endorse wholeheartedly, and I would like to read it out to all of us. All right? So I, I, be, I begin the quotation here. Many still cling to the myth that judges decide according to law and not politics. But the truth is that in difficult cases, adjudication is both law and politics. The methodology of the law in controversial cases lead not to one, but to several possible conclusions. In deciding between these alternatives, judges will be foolish not to be cognizant of the political implications of the choice they have to make. In such a situation, for the court to stick to its common law guns and push human rights and liberty regardless of the political consequences would be to invite institutional homicide. The forces of authoritarianism have the power to eviscerate the institution itself. And if suitably thresh threatened, that is exactly what will happen. Yet, to be indiscriminately subservient will be akin to committing institutionally, institutional suicide. A judiciary which always agrees with the government is hardly worth having at all. Allow me to repeat the sentence. A judiciary which always agrees with the government is hardly worth having at all. The judiciary has to walk this tightrope, but walk it must if it's to retain any meaningful existence at all. I wholly and completely agree with Professor Hall on this. This is the 
only viable path forward left for Hong Kong to walk. We from Singapore know this because we from Singapore have been through this. Only in this way can the candle flames of hope and liberty be kept flickering until dawn comes again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.